It's very important that we pray in line with his will and not our own. How do you do that? We need to conform our prayers, I want to say today, uh, conform our prayers so that they are in line with God's um, promises, God's priorities, and God's purposes. That's what we're going to look at today, those things. How do we pray in line with God's promises, God's priorities, and God's purposes? I want you to look back at that Psalm 102 with me. Um, we're going to start there. And uh, it's a pretty depressing little passage, wasn't it, that, uh, um, that Pat read to us before. Uh, this bloke who wrote it's obviously going through a really hard time. If you look at the little title uh, before, some, uh, before verse 1, it says, A Prayer of an Afflicted Man. Well, that's, uh, that's pretty obvious when you read it, isn't it? Uh, let's look at what he says in verse 3. For my days vanish like smoke, my bones burn like glowing embers, my heart is blight and withered like grass. I forget to eat my food. Because of my loud groaning, I'm reduced to skin and bones. This guy's going through uh, a lot of um, bad circumstances. Physically, uh, he's feeling terrible. Uh, we don't know if he's, if, he's, uh, if he's having heart trouble maybe or if he's, He's, uh, he's obviously not eating, he's, he's withering away. Uh, this guy's crook. Uh, but look in verse 6 and 7. I'm like a desert owl, like an owl among the ruins. I lie awake, I have become like a bird alone on a roof. He can't sleep at night and loneliness is, uh, is affecting uh, him. Uh, in, look at verse 8. He says, uh, all day long my enemies taunt me. Those who rail against me use my name as a curse. So his enemies are giving him a hard time. Uh, this guy's got a lot of problems. Look at verse uh, 9 and 10. He says, For I eat ashes as my food and mingle my drink with tears because of your great wrath. For you have taken me up and thrown me aside. See, so he's feeling like God's far away. In fact, God has discarded him uh, in punishment for his sin, in punishment for the nation's sin. Uh, God, is, uh, God has removed him uh, from his presence. And then in verse 11, he finishes with, My days are like the evening shadow. I wither away like grass. He doesn't have many days left on the calendar of his life. This guy's in a pretty bad situation, isn't he? The black dog of depression is growling at his door. And you can, and you can just imagine uh, what sort of condition he's in. But it's really important, the second half of this psalm, where does he go from here? in this terrible situation that he finds himself in. He remembers God's promises. Look in verse 13. Uh, you will arise and have compassion on Zion, for it is time to show favour to her. The appointed time has come. So he's remembering God's promises to save his people, uh, to be good and kind to his people, to show compassion to them. Uh, down in verse 16, for the Lord will rebuild Zion and appear in his glory. Verse 17, he will respond to the prayer of the destitute. He will not despise their plea. You see what's happening here is he's in a terrible situation, but in his prayer he's re recalling God's promises and he's repeating what he knows that God has promised both him and the nation. His prayer life is full of the promises of God. And in verse 28 we see finally he says, the children of your servants will live in your presence their descendants will be established before you. He knows that God will, will bring about things to be right in the end, that God will bring his people into his presence, that they will live with him. His prayer, his prayer life is full of God's promises. And I want to say in our prayers, in the situations that we find ourselves in, we need to recall God's promises. We need to fill up our prayers with God's promises. I've got a whole, um, a whole lot of examples here uh, that we're going to have a look at. Um, because, no, oh, hang on, sorry, I haven't turned this on yet. Oh. <laughs> uh, you might be feeling uh, like you're spiritually dry, uh, like you've been, you're a bit run down spiritually. Well, a promise like John 4.14 is great, isn't it? Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Or maybe that you're concerned uh, that you're going to face God's, if you face God's judgment, you would be doomed. Have a look at this from John 5, 24. Very truly I tell you, Jesus says, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over 
from death to life. What a great promise to remember in your prayers if you're feeling like you're failing God and, and, you, and you, you're under his judgment. Uh, how do I know if God's spirit is living in me? Someone asked me that question one time. How can I tell if God's spirit is in me? And you might be ask, asking that same question. Have a look at this promise in Acts 2. Uh, this is Peter speaking. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of, your, of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Maybe um, at times you're feeling, have I done enough to please God? Well, look at Romans 3.20 and the promises that are in this. Uh, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Maybe you're going through tough times and you don't understand why these things might be happening. Look at the promise in Romans 8. And I know many of you would know this verse. Uh, he says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Uh, if you're feeling um, that you need assurance of God's love, maybe you've been let down by others who should be loving you. Romans 8.38 for I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. A great promise to hang on to in your prayer time, isn't it? And to recall as you pray. Maybe you're thinking about life and death and what's going to happen. Look at this promise from 1 Corinthians 15. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you're struggling with doubts. Look at 2 Corinthians 1. He says, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Maybe you're facing physical struggles. 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Maybe you're concerned about your finances and your ability to be generous. Have a look at this promise. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Maybe you're facing difficulties in your family, who uh, some members of your family who shun your faith. Ephesians 1.5 is a great promise, isn't it? For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. And maybe... You're just feeling like the world is falling apart. It's going to hell in a handbasket. Have a look at Revelations 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. We have so many promises and I've just chosen these ones out of so many we could have looked at today. We have so many promises of God in the Bible. I want to encourage you to fill up your prayers with these promises. And what you can do, uh, it's a really good practice. You might want to take the white on the white sheets. You've got listed all these things. But you might want to... Um, I want to encourage you to, as you see a promise of God in the Bible, as you're reading your Bible at home or at church, as you see a promise, 
You've all got a blank page right at the start of your Bible. And it looks like that, okay? The inside cover of your Bible. Write it down. Write that verse out. I know a bloke called Terry Hughes who does this. And in the front of his Bible, he's got written all his favorite verses, verses that remind him of what God has done and what God promises him. And it's a great way, and he uses those verses to pray. It's a great way to fill up your prayers with the promises of God. That will be a much richer and deeper um, prayer time as we do that. So filling up our prayers with God's promises is important, but also I want to talk about filling up our prayers with God's priorities. Now I'm only going to speak about one priority today, um, and it's the harvest. There's uh, only a few specific things that Jesus tells his disciples to pray for. He tells them at one point uh, to pray for their enemies, and we should all do that, even though it's really difficult. We should pray for our enemies. Uh, he tells them to pray that they won't fall into temptation. Um, and this is the third one that he specifically tells them to pray for. And he says, pray. Uh, that uh, He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest food. This has got to be a priority in our prayers. This comes up on my prayer list every three days. And, uh, and I pray for you guys. I pray for you that God would send you out in his harvest field. Now, I'm not talking about wheat or sorghum or barley or those sorts of harvests. Obviously, we're not talking about that because if you read the verses just before these verses, you will see that Jesus looks at the crowds and he sees people who are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he's been teaching them the good news of the kingdom and bringing them into God's kingdom. That's the harvest, isn't it? People who need to come to know Jesus and his great love and salvation. People who need to be brought into his, into his kingdom. That's the harvest that's out there. And it's plentiful, Jesus says. But the workers are few. And as I pray about this, I pray for you. I pray that God would send you into the harvest. I pray for missionaries to go out to uh, other places and I pray for new ministers who are coming to our diocese and for blokes to go to Bible college and all that sort of stuff. But I pray for you that God would send you into the harvest field because you, you're, you're there. The harvest is all around you. And we need to be involved in this harvest. We need to join the harvest team, working to bring people into God's kingdom. You know, over the next couple of years, uh, you're going to hear about... Um, the, the mission that's happening right across the diocese. It's called Seeing Jesus Clearly. And uh, this mission uh, is, involves a couple of stages. Thanks, uh, Tim. And, and uh, the ambition of this uh, mission, have a look on the screen, it says the prayerful ambition is to equip Christians with the gospel and to get into every house and onto every farm with the gospel to introduce people to Jesus and help them home to heaven. That's the ambition, but... The stages of this uh, mission are that, first of all, in 2019, there's going to be a big emphasis on encouraging people to have a heart for the lost. Because often we, we get desensitized to it. We don't think about our neighbors and our family and our friends. And without Christ, these people are all going to hell. And we need to have a heart for the lost that will motivate us to pray for them and to reach out to them. So that's in 2019, you'll be encouraged to have a heart for the lost, uh, to pray more and more for those around you and to be trained to be harvest workers. That's the other part of 2019, that you'll be trained to work in the harvest, to plant seeds, to water them, to pray that God would cause the growth and that you would see people brought uh, into his uh, kingdom and that you'll be involved in that harvest. Uh, and then in 2020, uh, you'll know, you'll find out that uh, we've got a lot of mission activities planned right across the diocese, locally in churches and in regional centres, so that we can all be part of this harvest team. Because this is a this is a priority for God, and is it a priority for us? We need to be praying God's priorities. We need to be uh, filling up our prayer time with the priorities of God. And as you see the priorities of God in the Bible, write them down. Open the front cover of your Bible, write them down so that you can include them in your prayer time. 
So we're praying for God's promises. We're praying with God's priorities in mind. We also need to pray God's purposes. I want you to have a look in your Bibles at John 17. Oh, actually, I think I've got it on the screen. No, I don't. Yes, I do. John 17. Uh, it's on the screen. Jesus prays a great prayer uh, for his disciples in John 17 uh, because this is the night before he dies. We looked at this um, just earlier on in the year in our sermon series. Jesus prays for his disciples. and he, uh, I'm going to read a bit of the verses around these uh, two sentences. Uh, in verse 15 he says, My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too might be truly sanctified. And down in verse 22 he says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. But Jesus prays two great things for his, uh, his disciples, uh, two great purposes for his disciples, that they would be sanctified and that they would be unified. Sanctified and unified. In other words, that they would be set apart for God to belong to him, to serve him, to reflect his holiness to people around him, that they would be sanctified and that they would do that together, that they would be unified. How are they going to be sanctified and unified? Well, Paul prays some great prayers along these lines, and I've got a few on the screen for you to have a look at. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, a great prayer uh, for people to be sanctified. He says, This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Do you pray that for yourself? Do you pray that for others? Because as you pray this prayer for for each other and for yourselves, you're praying God's purposes for you. This is the sort of person that God wants you, this is what God wants to do in your life. So we need to be praying God's, filling up our prayers with God's purposes. Here's another one from Colossians chapter 1, a great prayer of Paul for uh, for the church in Colossae. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father. You pray that prayer for yourselves? What a great prayer to pray. And you can, you can slot someone else's name in there where it says you, just put in Warwick. You know, we continually ask God to fill Warwick with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You can pray that prayer for each other. And you're starting to pray God's purposes for yourself and for others. Here's one from, uh, that you should all know. Uh, I shouldn't even have to show you this one. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 to 14 because you've memorized it, haven't you? It says, for the grace of God has appeared That brings salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the the appearing of our the glory. It's a slightly different version, isn't it? Of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness, to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. What a great prayer to pray for yourselves and for others, that we would say no to ungodliness, and that we would live self-controlled, upright, godly lives. And the passage that we had, I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 3, the passage that we had as our Bible reading. A great prayer again from Paul uh, for the people he's writing to. Did you notice what he was praying for them as, uh, as Pat read that Bible reading before? Ephesians 3, it's page 1762. Verse 14, he says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. 
And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know that this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Isn't that what we want for each other? That we would be filled with the good... Uh, with t- Sorry, I'm going to read it to make sure I get it right. Be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. What a great prayer to pray for each other. That's God's purposes for us. We need to fill up our prayers with God's purposes. Because it will help us, first of all, to gain a greater understanding of what God's will is for, for, for you, first of all, and then for others. People often ask me or say to me, I wonder what God's will is for me. Well, here it is. This is what God wants for you. This is purpose for you. So fill up your prayer time with these purposes of God. See, back to the question at the start, what could you pray for? You can pray for anything. You can pray for your car keys. You can pray for the parking spot in front of the chemist. You can pray for anything. It doesn't matter. Fine, go for it. But what should you pray for? As you pray, I want to encourage you to fill up your prayer with the promises and priorities and purposes of God. Use these Bible passages. Insert people's names in there. So that, and maybe after the sermon each week, um, pray about what was in the sermon, what the message of that sermon for you. So we can pray that we'll find the car keys. But if you on, ever, only ever pray about incidental things, then look at all the great things that could make your prayer life richer and deeper and more meaningful and satisfying. I encourage you to fill up your prayer with God's promises and priorities and purposes. Let me pray for us. Father God, it is an enormous privilege that we have to come to the King of the universe to know that you are listening when we pray. Father, I pray that you would uh, help us to avoid the trap of just praying about the little incidental things. Uh, Although that's all right, Lord, we pray that you would help us to find that deeper and more meaningful and satisfying prayer life that comes from praying your promises, your priorities and your purposes. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be disciplined in our prayer so that we can come to you. We can know uh, that we're coming into your presence, the presence of the sovereign king of the universe that you hear us when we ask in prayer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.